<clears throat> so Lois Smith, uh, your new film, Marjorie Prime, uh, is quite an interesting concept indeed. It's uh, based on a play uh, which you were in. Can you tell us a little bit about the origins of this, uh, of this film? It was a play called Marjorie Prime, written by Jordan Harrison. It was a Pulitzer contender two years ago. It's, when I first read the play, I was probably more excited than I've ever been about a new play. I, I thought I had never read anything quite like it. I love the way it unfolds with surprise and not quite knowing where we are and letting us catch up. Um, and as I got to know it better, I, I found it so rich and full of humanity. Although it's a sometimes described sci-fi, it's certainly not basically a sci-fi film. It takes place about 50 years in the future. And uh, my character's uh, husband, who's been dead for 10 years, has been uh, provided as a hologram at a much earlier age, the age I chose to have him there as a companion. So that's the setup, which we learn about a little surprisingly as the, as the play begins and the movie begins the same way. Um, I, Jordan once said he was combining humanity and technology and I think he was very successful and that that's what he did. I love it because of its people, its thoughtfulness about how we live and treat ourselves and each other and oh, what we remember this, the memories and the stories we tell ourselves about our memories. <laughs> it's such a great subject. <laughs> tell us a little bit about Marjorie, uh, the character you play. She's 85. She's for, forgetting things. Um, I've always felt her a person who was full of life. And in the course of the play and film, she uh, retains, I think, some of the flirtatiousness and lust for life that characterized her. That's my sense of her. Um, she has accepted and seems to like the idea of having this companion, though she's quite, uh, she's quite aware of what it is and what it, he, is, and uh, seems to enjoy the process. Also sometimes be distressed by it. Also sometimes taking advantage of its uh, familiar camaraderie. It's all of those things that it's about, this relationship. It's not the only relationship. John Hamm plays um, Walter Prime the name of, of this character. And uh, John Hamm and I are the parents of Gina Davis and Tim Robbins is, is our son-in-law. Now that's a pretty strange arrangement, isn't it? But it's <laughs> really quite a... <laughs> um, so, so my daughter and son-in-law live with me and take care of me. I also have a caretaker. And I also have Walter Prime. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the cast, um, that, that leads into another question. What was it like working uh, with so many uh, great actors in, in, a, in what is really a, an ensemble piece? It really is, yes, yeah. <laughs> well, I've had the great unusual privilege of working with three casts two in the theater and one in the, in the film. There was some overlap in the plays, but uh, they were never the same. So um, I feel I've worked with lots of great actors and had lots of great partners in this, in this venture. Uh, and in every case, I think the actors were delighted to be part of this and to have these characters to play. They're, First class characters. <laughs> you also, um, I, I hope this isn't a spoiler for people who haven't seen the movie, but later on in the film, you play your own uh, 
I, I don't know how to describe it, but I guess sort of Marjorie Prime later on in the film. Can you talk a little bit about um, uh, the challenges of, of that, of, of playing this sort of second version of a character? Yes. Uh, in the course of the story, um, um, Marjorie passes away. But this being something you can order, uh, her daughter and son-in-law provide a prime. And so now there is Marjorie Prime and my daughter, played by Gina Davis, can use the companionship of Marjorie Prime as Marjorie used the companionship of Walter Prime. The relationship is actually quite different. So, so there are, as it, as it eventually turns out, three of us get to play two characters, both the character and the character Prime. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable, interesting challenge. Having played this role on the stage uh, and now in the film, in the film, were you able to find new nuances, new shades of the character that you hadn't before after having played Not it so here. many times? Can you hear me? I said, uh, having. Not hearing you. Having now. done. Okay. Uh, having done the role so many times on stage, uh, when it came to doing the film, were you able to find new nuances or new shades of the character? I'm sorry, you're in and out. I hear a little and then I can't hear you. Um, having done the role so many times on stage, when you went to do the film, were you able to find new nuances or new shades of the character? You know, not only I think in the sense that everything is always new in the moment, and I had new um, uh, partners to be playing with, there wasn't any particular change in Marjorie, I don't think, and nor did Michael Amareda seem to want it different. It's, of course, different because it's a film and we're all over the place, not confined in a room and a chair, which was basically true uh, on the stage. Talk a little bit about working with Michael Amareda. What, what did he give you as a director that uh, helped with the performance? I think uh, I think he had a real love and understanding of the character and of the play as well. There are differences in tone, I, I think real ones. Um, there's more humor in the play and more um, languor and meditation in the film. It's but it's basically the same story and in a way the same relationships, but of course they're different with a different uh, director in charge and different actors playing them. Was there a scene that was particularly difficult for you or I mean, was it all just sort of easy now that you've done it so many times on the stage? There certainly was an ease from having, being so familiar with it. I'd been living with this, text for about four years. It, I was given the play when it was first written and there was a lot of time went by in the course of getting productions, doing the productions, the time between them. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a journey of length for me <laughs> and a, a, a one I lo love taking. The film and, and the play, for that matter, raises a lot of interesting questions about technology and uh, its relationship to humanity. Um, I mean, and here we are talking on uh, uh, Google Hangout over the web and computers. As I understand it, you're also a, a new uh, member of Twitter. Um, so, I mean, what do you think of all this new technology and, yes. and its relation? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, I mean, what do you think I'm, about I'm all sorry, that? didn't you? What do you think about all this new technology and its relationship to humanity and sort of the questions that are posed within the the story? I've not been a uh, partaker of social media until really a few days ago when I became a, a what do you call it, a member of something of, of uh, I, 
I have a Twitter account. That's what I'm <laughs> You're a tweeter now, yeah. <laughs> a great surprise to me, actually. <laughs> I'll see what, see what happens. <laughs> um, I think I have some, I'm so aware of people who use social media enormously. One of the things I wonder is, where do they find the time to, because they do seem to spend a lot of time. I am sometimes overwhelmed just by the time it takes to keep up with emails and, and so on. I, uh, I am perhaps a slow mover, but I would not feel uh, uh, capable of spending all that time. And, and I think I wouldn't want to. I think it's... Um, I'm, besides, there are so many ways of looking at it. I'm sure there are people who learn enormously what they need and want to know. I'm sure there are people who it might it might be hours and hours and not much more than than gossip, or you know. So uh, it, it's such a, it's such an enormous opening in the world, and I suppose the question really is, and maybe that gets back to the subject of Marjorie Prime. What do we do with it? What do we do with it if we have new capabilities as as human beings? That I do believe speaks to Mar Marjorie Prime. Uh, I don't know what to make of it entirely. Who does actually? Who knows what's next in the in the this technical universe? I don't know. Very true. Um, so uh, just a, a couple of other things. I mean, you, um, if you are nominated for an Oscar for this movie and should win, uh, you would become the oldest Oscar winner in history. Although uh, James Ivory might uh, beat you at that. Uh, he would be 89 years old should he win this year. So number one, I mean, what would that mean for you? And number two, what are you going to do to take down James Ivory so he won't beat your record? <laughs> <laughs> now, the me? Is that one of the dangers of social media? <laughs> You're asking me how I would take down What a <laughs> dreadful question. <laughs> I don't want to take down James Ivory. I am in his, as we all are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. I'm glad to know that. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um. But I mean, what would that kind of recognition mean for you in, in your career to uh, to receive an Oscar or even just a nomination for this movie for a role that you've uh, lived with for so long? What would it mean to me? I, I think what it would probably mean to me. It would probably mean that um, that sort of major interesting parts that I hadn't been the first person to be offered them before would come my way. Um, that probably is an out. Well, one of my agents described to me, well, that's what it means, you know, more. This is a profession in which uh, being known matters. As far as I'm concerned, it's, it's not what you start out with and it's not the main thing. But in order to get you work, and that helps you get more work and better work, and that's how I've had a long life of that and a fortunate one. I've had lots of lovely, interesting work. And so, I guess, if I was an Oscar winner, I'd get, I'd get maybe more, bigger, better parts that paid better. That's probably what it would mean. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? I think so. I think so, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you've already been nominated for a Gotham Award for the movie. So, I mean, what does that mean for you? Yeah. I don't know. The same, <laughs> but, the same but less. I mean, uh, yeah. Right. Um, uh, uh, speaking of your career, I, I did want to ask you a, just a couple of uh, career-related questions. Um, I believe your first movie role was in East of Eden, working for Elia Kazan and, and with James Dean. So, I mean, what were some of your memories of that? Oh, being a, being a first movie was, <laughs> and such a big, lovely one, and such wonderfully talented people. It was I remember the first time being on the set and not being able to understand that everybody who was after me and every would at some crucial point simply fade into the background and there I'd be unfocused and unready. That was a big lesson I learned on the set of East of Eden. Oh, <laughs> yes, you're cooperating with everybody around you, but at some point you better know what you're thinking about. So 
that was one thing. Um, Kazan was wonderful with actors. He loved, he was an actor himself. He loved uh, improvisatory uh, ways of working, uh, what happens between people. And James Dean was so lovely in the part and easy to work with. At that point, he was simply a lovely young actor in his first movie role. He wasn't an icon. It was not, so there's none of the, what is now surrounds him in history is different, of course, than it was in those days. That's a long time ago. Yes. Uh, and uh, one of uh, my favorite movies and, and one of the most important movies of um, the last 50 years, Five Easy Pieces, where you play Jack Nicholson's sister. Um, what were some of your memories of, of that movie? In that one, there was so much, there's always, God willing, cooperation and collaboration. That film, directed by, Do by uh, Bob Rafelson, had so much of that sense. We all... Uh, we all ate dinner together every night in the motel we stayed with in Vancouver Island, where the house was that the family lived in. Um, so we were always uh, in the in the most relaxed and wonderful way, dealing with the story, with each other, with what happened that day, what might happen tomorrow, with the script. It was quite uh, a lot of fun. This year as well, you've got another film out that um, uh, re reminds us of sort of the spirit and, and style of something like Five Easy Pieces, Lady Bird by Greta yeah. Gerwig. You play uh, uh, Sister Sarah Joan, Sister Sarah yeah. Joan. Um, yes. Tell us a little bit. I mean, that movie has just opened and is doing really well, and especially box office. Yes. Um, what, what can you tell us about that film? Oh, that's Greta kind of Gerwig. She's really something. I already knew that, having been enormously impressed as an actress and as a writer, but now she directed, wrote and directed this, this really lovely piece. It's a pleasure to be in it. I have a little part of the, the nun teacher. Uh, she's, she's remarkable. And um, I once met a movie director, Miguel Arteta. And I w it was when I was shooting it and I, when I mentioned her name, he said, she has stardust. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Very much so. Uh, well, Lois Smith, uh, thank you so much, and uh, congratulations on your work in Marjorie Prime and in Lady Bird, uh, and uh, best of luck to you. I really thank appreciate you, it. Thank you. Have a good day.